Good morning, good afternoon for everyone. Greetings from MSM United Kingdom. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the third webinar of our City and Geographic Seminar Series on how to improve my daily City and Geographic practice. Our professor uh, today who is presenting is Christian Löwe, who is very passionate about education and sharing clinical best practice. Since 2014, he has been the chairman of the Educational Committee of the European Society of Cardiac Radiology and has authored over 80 original articles in different peer-reviewed journals. He is associate editor of Radiology and founded Vienna Heart, a teaching platform for cardiac imaging. Dr. Leva is currently the head of the Division of Cardiovascular and Interventional Radiology at the Medical University of Vienna. Now, without further delay, I will hand over the word to Professor Leva for his presentation. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Sholten, for these uh, kind introductions. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to our third chapter uh, of about how to improve my daily CT and geography. Uh, as you might know, we defined uh, three chapters within this story about uh, how to improve daily um, uh, CT and geography. Chapter one was about uh, the contrast. Chapter two was about less is more. And the, the idea and the topic of today is what, to show you a little bit what becomes possible and to go really deep into the clinical practice. So uh, today, uh, the, uh, the title of uh, this uh, webinar will be What Becomes Practically Possible, and my teaching points include uh, to try my best to show you how you could change maybe your standardized protocols into really personalized protocols, so how to implement the content of the first two chapters of this webinar uh, roadmap into your daily practice, uh, to show you maybe some new indications but maybe even uh, upcoming challenges, and uh, to do that by showing clinical examples. And to reach my teaching points, I defined uh, three different areas, and I will try to cover my teaching points uh, according to those three uh, clinical areas, including the clinical CT and geography, so it's more about CT and geography of large vessels, uh, about the clinical CT and geography of the heart, and finally, a very specific, very challenging but very interesting topic about uh, clinical CT and geography of body and heart in uh, really very small children. Well, without any further delay, let's really jump into the first uh, big topic. It's about uh, how to improve the clinical CT and geography of the body and how to implement uh, all the, the things that we have learned in Chapter 1 and 2 uh, of those webinars. Well, in fact, uh, given our new uh, scanners, CT and geography in general becomes a very easy task. So the challenge or the question that we have to uh, fulfill, and this becomes technically very easy, is to scan uh, during uh, the arterial phase of our intravenously uh, administered uh, contrast agent. And this is definitely not a challenge anymore because our scanners are that fast. Even the spatial resolution is not a really challenge anymore because the new scanners provide a really fantastic uh, uh, spatial resolution. And uh, as uh, I presented in the last webinar, even the radiation dose is not such a big challenge anymore uh, because we can apply nowadays many different dose-saving strategies and it uh, becomes possible to reduce the radiation exposure to the patients tremendously by using these, those new scanners. However, uh, with the new uh, techniques and the new scanners, uh, we have improved and even new possibilities, so we try to make new applications, and consequently, we are facing new challenges, and I will show you that on the three different areas uh, of the body vessels, uh, about the new challenges, the new uh, possibilities, and of course, uh, to give you an idea about possible solutions or how to face those challenges and, uh, and new possibilities in the clinical routine. The three uh, anatomical areas that I selected for that, uh, well, in fact, two anatomical areas and the practical question will include the CT angel of the aorta, the CT angel of the peripheral arteries, and a really brand new application, which is called so-called functional CT angiography, uh, should be the third topic for these three areas. Well, let's start with uh, CT of the aorta. A very um, important topic for the application of uh, CT and geography because uh, CT really has become the, the first method of choice uh, to 
uh, the first method of choice to uh, fulfill all the demands and to answer all the questions uh, regarding aortic disease. When we start with the imaging of the acute aortic syndromes, I would like just to give you a very brief uh, introduction into this, uh, this disease. And then I will try to, uh, to give you some ideas how the ideal uh, examination protocol could look like when we are facing patients uh, suspected to have an acute aortic syndrome. Well, in fact, it's a, a rather rare disease, uh, acute aortic uh, syndrome. However, it's a very uh, bad disease with a very dismal, very poor prognosis and a high mortality rate uh, in case uh, of no uh, treatment or uh, with, in case of delayed diagnosis. The summary of all these diseases uh, under the term acute aortic uh, syndrome uh, they are characterized by typical or more or less typical aortic pain, which is typically located dorsally. And uh, the, the reason for this aortic pain uh, are a different life-threatening aortic diseases. And usually the patients are already under very critical circulatory conditions when they uh, reach the hospital. And there are the usual questions about the imaging technique or the best imaging technique uh, in, in such a situation uh, facing such a patient, how many faces do we need? So it means uh, contrast uh, faces. Uh, should we apply ECG triggering? Yes or no. And uh, how the perfect scan parameters and contrast protocol should look like. Well, the question how many faces is always the question, should we add an, a native scan on top? This may add a little bit more uh, radiation dose, and of course, this may take some time. But of course, the value of the native scan in acute aortic syndrome is that uh, it's really very much helpful in the detection of an intramural hematoma, can be sometimes very uh, discreet finding, and having an and a native scan makes life easier because you easily can detect the, uh, the bright uh, semicircular uh, wall thickening and the density of this wall hematoma is higher as the non-enhanced aortic lumen. Of course, having your new scanners and having a purely uh, arterial phase scan, usually it's not a problem uh, to detect the intramural hematoma, but it makes life easier, and especially if you are not so experienced or for your residents, it makes life easier to have this native scan because then you can really uh, detect and diagnose this intramural hematoma without any doubt. Of course, uh, not always uh, the patient comes in with the clear suspicion of an acute aortic syndrome. So sometimes it's unknown what the reason for the chest pain or the critical situation for the patient might be. And sometimes maybe you don't have this native scan because you were initially looking for something else. So what you can do um, if you don't have a native scan and you are not sure if this is really an intramural hematoma or if this uh, may be just a plaque or a, a, a mural thrombus, you can try to go one step back uh, to look the monitoring scan, which is an unenhanced scan. Of course, it's not the perfect solution. Of course, it's not as nice as the native scan, but sometimes it can uh, even help you you can also see here in this example that that's just from the normal monitoring scan that you have this brighter rim uh, and uh, of course this is an intramural hematoma as well and not a plaque or an uh, or a mural thrombus so maybe it's not perfect to use the pre-monitoring scan but maybe it's better uh, than nothing if you are uh, unsure but in fact it's highly recommended if you have a patient uh, suspected to have an acute aortic syndrome to at the native scan. Nowadays, uh, the uh, additional radiation exposure is not as high and it makes uh, life for you and of course for the patient easier. Personally, I'm really a friend to add even a venous phase scan, even uh, if the question is just for aortic disease, because it gives you a very good impression about the possible uh, uh, problems at the end organs, so mold perfusion or complications, and you can even get some information about the flow situation within uh, the true and the false lumen in case of acute aortic dissections. So I'm really in favor uh, to use three uh, contrast phase, uh, phases, including native, arterial, and venous phase scan in patients suffering from an acute aortic syndrome. 
The next question is about the EC tr triggering yes or no, and I will try to answer the question by just showing you uh, three examples. Well, that uh, is an example of a 35-year-old uh, uh, male patient coming into the hospital suffering from severe acute chest pain. Then they did an echo, and they found this rather dense uh, pericardial effusion, so there was a really high suspicion of an acute aortic dissection. And as you see here, we have a lot of pulsation artifacts at the aortic root. In this patient with a very dense uh, pericardial diffusion, so it's very, very difficult to rule out or to safely diagnose the um, uh, acute aortic dissection here and to safely differentiate between artifact and dissection membrane. Uh, of course, maybe in this patient, the chest pain was uh, mainly because of the pulmonary embolism on the left side, but in fact, we are not able to differentiate between dissection and artifact here. Or another example, this patient uh, was uh, transferred to my hospital with a helicopter with the uh, already established diagnosis from an out. Uh, patient uh, unit uh, of an acute aortic syndrome suffering from severe chest pain. Of course, these are just the artifacts, but it's very difficult to convince your cardiac surgeon if he has a written uh, referral for an acute aortic dissection. It was very, very helpful in this situation to be able just to repeat the scan uh, by using an ECG uh, triggering technique. And of course, it becomes uh, possible to safely rule out any aortic dissection in this case. So it it's really helpful to apply your ECG gating. Another third example, patient, of course, suffering from acute aortic dissection, but at the aortic root, again, it's not totally clear is this just the aortic valve or is this really the dissection. And in fact, of course, this was an acute type A dissection with a total rupture of the intimal layer. So ECG uh, triggering is really helpful to, uh, to assess the aortic root and to safely differentiate between the uh, dissection membrane and an artifact. Well, an acute dissection is, an, uh, is a very dynamic process, so the dissection membrane is not a stationary something. Uh, we have movement of the dissection membrane during the cardiac cycle, so the True lumen can be compressed in systole, but can be even even bigger in diastole, uh, even for the assessment of the real functional situation and the dynamic situation, it's very helpful to have this ECG triggering. If uh, uh, time is really uh, very costly and the patient is really in a very critical situation or your staff is not, uh, uh, not well trained to apply ECG triggering even uh, in the acute setting, um, one alternative uh, could be to go for a very fast scanning with a really high pitch. We have shown in a paper that the assessment of the aortic root is even possible by uh, such a high pitch scanning. So in that regard, there is no uh, difference in the diagnostic accuracy between high pitch scanning because the temporal resolution is that high and ECG triggering. However, if you would aim to get even some dynamic information about the dissection membrane and the flow situation, ECG triggering is highly recommended. So that's why uh, I, I'm really in favor to answer the question too with a clear yes. If you are able to apply ECG triggering, you should in the acute setting. Again, it makes life easier and uh, helps you a lot to safely differentiate between the artifacts and to get even a little bit more flow information. What about the scan parameters and the contrast protocol in the acute setting? Well, in fact, uh, we don't need uh, a clear uh, adaption of the contrast protocol uh, from the acute setting, so you can use your standardized protocol uh, for uh, aortic imaging. And uh, what you should apply, as we have uh, trained in, in Model two, uh, 2, in Chapter 2 of, uh, of this webinar road, um, you should adapt to the body mass index and to the KV settings. So first of all, assess the body mass index and categorize your patient into obese, normal, or very slim. Then you have to adapt uh, the KV settings. And when you're adapting the KV settings, you should keep in mind that you have to adapt uh, your iodine uh, injection protocol as well because as lower the KV setting, as uh, denser your contrast material will become, so that means you can reduce the total amount of uh, contrast agent when you're reducing the uh, KV settings to end up with a similar uh, intra-arterial enhancement. 
So in fact, uh, if we have a normal uh, patient, we reduce our KV settings as we have uh, trained uh, in, in the previous module. So if the, we go down to a KV setting of 100, of course, we are reducing uh, the total volume of uh, the contrast. And if it's a, a slim patient, we can even further go down to 80 KV. And of course, we were reducing the uh, contrast material down to 80 ml. And again, of course, uh, bodus triggering is always obligatory, so no best guess anymore, uh, no standard delay. We have to use a bodus triggering in all CT angiographies nowadays. So just a very brief summary of the imaging technique for the acute aortic imaging. The native scan is very helpful uh, because it helps uh, to recognize an intramural hematoma. It's not, not mandatory, but it's really helpful. Um, from my point of view, it's really mandatory uh, and uh, really important to add the venous face scan for the abdomen to become able to really directly assess uh, possible complications or malperfusions. And uh, I'm really in favor for uh, the application of the ECG gating uh, to remain able to safely differentiate between artifact and um, dissection and to get an information about the flow dynamics uh, within the true and the false lumen. What about the role of uh, CT angiography uh, prior to endovascular or surgical treatment? This is really an evolving role, so uh, the number of referrals in the, for this question is continuously increasing, and the questions are, are a little bit different. It can be the detection of the calcifications at the region of uh, the aortic clamp uh, if an open surgery is planned, so that can be a classical uh, uh, aortic valve repair by a surgical means, or it, it can also be uh, coronary bypass graft surgery, and it becomes uh, really of increasing importance to the cardiac surgeons to get information about the distribution of the calcifications. They uh, decide the localization of the aortic clamp depending on this uh, uh, CT done prior to surgery. And by doing that, they are able to reduce the perioperative uh, stroke rate by 50%. So it's really a very important thing. However, maybe even more important is the, the assessment uh, of the uh, excess vessel diameter and the assessment of uh, then the sizing of the, uh, of the future device in case of minimal uh, aortic valve repair or in case of minimal mitral valve repair. And there are really fantastic new tools available in uh, minimal invasive uh, cardiac surgery. NCT plays a very important role uh, in the planning for that. So that's our daily daily work today, is this planning before and transapical or transfemoral aortic valvular repair. We have to uh, do a CT angiography of the aorta, and then we have to uh, do this um, double angulated multiplinar reformation to become able to directly measure the diameter of the annulus and to perfectly size the diameter of the minimal invasive uh, uh, prosthesis. And of course, we have to also uh, size uh, the excess vessel. So by all this innovation uh, that they are uh, going on in the treatment for the so-called structural heart disease, CT plays an increasing role, and uh, we are really mandatory, so we have to optimize our protocol, we have to optimize our radiation exposure, we have to optimize our uh, contrast material administration, because we play such an important role in the management of these uh, uh, cardiac patients. But not only for the planning, of course, even for the follow-up, uh, CT angiography um, plays a very important role, and I will mention that even in the in the chapter for the functional imaging. So, of course, as we can see here, we can uh, directly uh, assess the device patency. Uh, we can really do a treatment control. And of course, uh, when we are talking about the endovascular or the repair, uh, we can directly even uh, assess the persisting aneurysm perfusion, the so-called endoleaks, after unsuccessful uh, exclusion of the aortic aneurysm. And we can also use the CT as a planning tool for the upcoming treatment of uh, a possible complication. So CTA has become the method of choice, not only as a planning tool, but even as the follow-up tool, because it combines the high spatial resolution with a very good and almost everywhere uh, availability. 
Again, here the questions uh, in regard to those saving strategies. Uh, should we go for a single uh, phase scan, so that means just a native scan, just to assess the aortic diameter after endovascular repair? Should it be a double phase, so native endotrial phase, or should, should it be a triple phase scan? And given the fact that the patient are, patients are in need for a lifelong follow-up, of course, it's an important question how many phases uh, uh, we are acquiring and uh, how uh, high the radiation exposure to the patient uh, will be since we are really dealing with um, uh, cumulative radiation exposure to the patient. However, um, there are groups in favor for only a venous phase scan because they say, well, the diameter can be assessed uh, by the venous phase scan and, of course, the endoleaks can be seen at the venous phase scan as well. However, I am in, fa in favor not to skip the arterial phase because aortic aneurysm is an arterial disease, and when we have the patient for follow-up, we should not only focus on the stand graft itself, we should also remain able to assess the arterial system. So that's just an example. With a late occlusion of the renal artery, and uh, you already see this mild perfusion and shrinkage of the upper pole of the left uh, kidney here, and of course, that's an important information. So when we have the patient uh, during follow-up, we should be able even to assess uh, the arterial structures. And of course, the venous phase scan is important to, to uh, allow us for the assessment of even slow flow endoleaks and to directly uh, assess even and demonstrate even inflammatory processes. And of course, uh, to uh, look even for non-vascular diseases like a screening examination. Since the, uh, the cumulative dose is really an issue, uh, we tried to uh, set up a protocol by really limiting uh, the uh, radiation dose exposure. Uh, and this has been recently been published in European Radiology. And our proposal was to combine a split bolus uh, contrast administration with uh, the possibility of a dual energy uh, um, uh, CT acquisition. By applying the dual energy technique, this allows for the assessment of a virtual non-contrast, so we can even reconstruct this virtual native scan. This helps to differentiate between calcifications and the real endoleak within the lumen, and giving the contrast material as a split bolus allows for simultaneous assessment of the arterial structures and even the uh, delayed or delayed uh, endoleaks. So with just one uh, application, just one scan, three different phases, and of course, this is highly dose saving, and it has been shown that uh, we are really able to um, demonstrate and detect all the endoleaks uh, that, we, uh, that have been detected with the standardized protocol as well. And very recently, a couple of papers have been also published uh, showing that, of course, we can apply all our low-dose uh, strategies even in the patients after um, uh, endovascular aortic repair, ending up with a protocol uh, in the range of 1 to 2 millisieverts and just 40 to 50 uh, ml of contrast. And of course, uh, this is very important in this uh, very sensitive group of patients in need for a lifelong follow-up. So the contrast protocol optimization is, of course, crucial here uh, in this indication prior and even after, um, uh, prior and after uh, endovascular repair. And the, the split bolus dual energy protocols uh, allow for really significant uh, radi uh, radiation dose reduction in the post-EVAR imaging. Let's leave the uh, aortic topic uh, and uh, move on to the CTA of the peripheral arteries. Well, um, one big uh, issue in the past for the peripheral arteries at CT was the huge uh, volume of the examination. This problem could be solved by the new scanners, so the volume coverage is no really limitation anymore thanks to the fantastic improvement of technical possibilities of the new scanners. What the challenging uh, might be is that we are scanning a little bit too fast, so the risk is only that we are passing the bolus because our acquisition speed is uh, faster as the blood flows, so we have to reduce our possible, technically possible acquisition speed uh, to avoid any passing of the bolus. We would like to end up with a very homogeneous, very bright contrast enhancement during the entire volume. And this has been shown even uh, almost 20 years before that uh, when we are talking about uh, large examination volumes, it's really helpful uh, to give a biphasic bolus injection 
So that means the first third of the total bolus is given uh, at a high injection speed and the uh, second two thirds are uh, injected with a, lower, a slower speed and uh, at the final end, the enhancement within the patient will be much more homogeneous during this entire large volume. And again, this has been published even uh, 70 years before that a biphasic injection protocol is helpful when we are talking about rather long acquisition times and rather long examination volumes. So that's the only uh, indication, the peripheral arteries, where we still uh, are in favor for the biphasic uh, bolus injection. We are starting with uh, a small amount of uh, contrast uh, with a high flow rate, and after one-third of the total uh, bolus, total amount of uh, contrast, we are reducing um, the injection speed by 50%, and this really helps to end up with a very homogeneous, bright, and a stable enhancement during the entire uh, imaging volume. And it has been shown that uh, CTA, uh, in, with using such a protocol, can be really used to set, set up the uh, treatment recommendations and to plan the treatment uh, in patients suffering from critical limb ischemia. In fact, in, in the beginning, of course, it was a high uh, radiation dose examination as well. It's not as important as in other areas of the body because the legs are not, not really re, uh, radiation uh, sensitive. However, uh, it's not only about the legs, it's even about the pelvic region, highly dose uh, sensitive. So of course we have to apply all our dose saving strategies even for the peripheral arteries. So we have to, uh, 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 following the rules that we uh, set up in Chapter 2 about the less radiation dose and about everything I have said about the personalization, of course, we have to implement all those tools, even for the peripheral arteries, um, to uh, apply for um, and, and to, to provide our patients a low-dose uh, strategy, even for the peripheral arteries. Peripheral arterial occlusive disease and is an uh, is an chronic progressive disease, so the patient tends to come back and come back and come back. Uh, so the cumulative radiation dose is an issue uh, in this group of patients as well. So therefore, radiation dose reduction is really important. And it has been shown, of course, that even low KV protocols are highly useful, of course, even for the, uh, for the peripheral vessels. And this has been uh, published uh, three years before that even uh, an effective dose of just two millisieverts for an entire peripheral runoff uh, CTA study becomes possible. Just a few clinical examples by using a low KV uh, strategy, so reducing the total uh, dose length product uh, down to 300 and providing a very homogeneous and very bright contrast enhancement uh, during the entire peripheral vasculature, uh, giving very nice impression uh, about the, uh, the distribution of disease. Here, another example, those things, product of 350, very homogeneous contrast enhancement by using this biphasic uh, injection protocol. So that's an example. Uh, in, a, in a patient with a uh, slightly increased body mass index of close to 27, so it's a 100, 100 kV protocol. And again, a biphasic injection with a rather slow flow rate for the second two-thirds of the total uh, uh, volume, and you see the contrast enhancement is very homogeneous during the entire uh, imaging volume, and that's exactly uh, what we are aiming for and the dose length product here was even only 230 for the entire peripheral study. Big challenge is still the reconstruction of the peripheral CTA. Uh, of course, it's not possible to assess a CTA uh, like this and to demonstrate your surgeon that there is an uh, SFA occlusion and the, the surgeon has to place a bypass graft there. So re we really need the reconstruction techniques, uh, but uh, all of them are not totally perfect, and most of them are really even time-consuming. Um, of course, uh, what can be used is a, is a normal MIP uh, projection, but there is the risk of uh, pseudo-occlusions, especially when it comes to a proximity to bony structures. Then there is sometimes an artificial occlusion of an infect uh, patent vessel. So you have to have uh, you have to manually edit and improve your outcome, and this is rather time-consuming. Um, uh, however, they give a 
rather good overview about the situation, but they are critical in case of calcifications and stents. Uh, what we have introduced are a curved pinner reformations, uh, and what we have implemented is the possibility to, to summarize all the different passes uh, through to all the different lower leg vessels into one stack. So that's a so-called multi-path uh, uh, curved pinner reformation, and it gives you a perfect overview, and uh, all those uh, images here are really a center-lined path uh, through the uh, lower leg vessels. And they give you a very quick and good overview about the situation and it allows even for the assessment of the vessel behind calcifications or within a stent, as in the given example here. So significant radiation dose reduction is possible by use uh, of uh, low KV protocols and uh, can be used, of course, uh, with very good results for the peripheral vessels as well. The last remaining really limiting factor for the broad CTA application for the peripheral vessels are still the complex reconstructions. And we are sure that CPR, or better, even the multipass CPR, are really the methods of very first choice uh, to reconstruct them. However, there are no perfect automatic tool commercially available out at the market. Finally, just to give you an, um, an impression about what the new techniques uh, allows for new applications, and uh, I named this the so-called functional CTA. And uh, functional CTA becomes possible uh, due to the really significant radiation dose reduction. So we become able now to do even a dynamic acquisition. And of course, the, the reduction of um, temporal or the improvement of the temporal resolution uh, plays an important role as well. And uh, this functional imaging uh, becomes uh, an increasing importance for treatment decision making and uh, will really define emerging clinical uh, applications for the future. Uh, I will just give you an insight into three different applications, CTA of the thoracic outlet in chronic mesenteric ischemia or dynamic CTA um, after treatment. Well, thoracic outlet syndrome, you know, uh, it's a it's a functional disease, uh, but um, since our acquisition is that quick and the radiation dose is that uh, that low, we become able now to really do a functional assessment so we are able to uh, do the CTA scan uh, in rest and even in provocation to directly show this compression um, of uh, this uh, left subclavian, of this right subclavian artery in this example by an extensive exostosis of the first rib. And uh, this functional uh, imaging just becomes possible with the new scanners. Uh, very challenging is even the assessment of the median accurate ligament syndrome, or even called this Dumber syndrome. You know, you see an, uh, an stenosis of the celiac trunk in many patients, and in, uh, sometimes it's very unclear if this is causing symptoms. A patient is coming for diffuse abdominal pain, then you see the, this uh, stenosis of the celiac trunk, and you don't know if this is a finding or if this is really a pathology. And in many patients, this is caused by a fibrotic arch crossing the aorta ventrally and uh, connecting both uh, uh, crooks of the diaphragm, uh, so-called uh, median acrid ligament. And uh, with the new scanners, it becomes possible to really nicely uh, assess the patient for the presence or absence of such a median accurate ligament syndrome. And what we are currently doing is uh, we are asking the patient to make a really deep inspiration, and we are scanning, we are giving contrast, and then we are scanning in the deep inspiration. And then we uh, let the patient breathe out, and we are doing a very quick acquisition on the way back during the same uh, contrast dose injection. So with the quick scanners, it becomes possible to do this uh, fast acquisition dur during the injection of only one single contrast bolus. And we can nicely see here this increasing of the uh, celiac uh, uh, trunk stenosis in expiration as a proof of the presence of an uh, uh, median accurate ligament syndrome. If the patient is symptomatic here, uh, it's uh, a contraindication to place a stent here. Uh, first, there has to be a surgical release of this median accurate ligament and only as a second step, uh, we should place a stent in. Otherwise, there is a high risk of stent fracture and uh, subsequent occlusion of the celiac trunk. Uh, and this was, of course, make the symptoms of the patient um, uh, more critical. Unfortunately, the uh, movies are not, uh, uh, not working out here. 
but this should just show you that uh, by applying ECG gating, we also become possible directly demonstrate the movement of the aortic arch, and we can also use it as a dynamic acquisition to uh, differentiate between high flow and slow flow endoleaks after endovascular aortic repair, which is sometimes uh, really critical and challenging. Just to give you an insight that due to the significant radiation dose reduction, new and even dynamic acquisitions will become possible and uh, this will uh, provide the possibility of adding functional information to the morphology. And that's a totally new field, and that's, that's really interesting. And the role of uh, radiology and CT and geography will really, really uh, increase, even thanks to uh, those new possibilities in the very close future. Well, we already have heard a lot about the application of uh, clinical CT and geography of the heart and how to improve the protocol. So this was also the topic of the previous two webinars. Uh, I think I already have shown that the optimized imaging uh, technique is really crucial to allow for the accurate assessment of for coronary arteries, to allow for providing optimal image information for advanced analysis like CTFFR, advanced plaque analysis, perfusion, and so on, and of course to uh, allow for radiation dose reduction and further optimization. We really need an optimized intravascular uh, contrast uh, to remain able to assess the changes within the uh, wall of the coronaries to allow for plaque analysis to differentiate between uh, really uh, changes in the wall or, or, or calcifications. So the, the uh, enhancement should be just perfect, should not be too bright, but uh, it should be high enough. And uh, uh, we need an, uh, a contrast dose administration and optimization as we have already learned. Of course, radiation dose reduction is crucial as well. So we have heard uh, in the previous module that the selection of the triggering mode is really the most important thing. It has a big impact on the radiation dose exposure to the patient if we are going with a prospective or a retrospective ECG gating technique. Uh, they are really combined with a huge difference in the radiation exposure. And uh, the selection of the trigger mode is depending mainly on the heart rate of the patient, but also on the predisposed probability for coronary artery disease and uh, the referring diagnosis. With other words, the CCTA button does not exist anymore. Uh, CCTA becomes a little bit more complex, but of course, even it's more fun because we have more possibilities to improve and to provide better results. What we really need is the individual selection of the examination protocol uh, as we already have heard, three main um, uh, fields or three main possibilities regarding the triggering technique, including first the step and shoot, the really poor prospectively triggered scan, uh, only recommended in patients with a sinus rhythm and very low heart rates, and the best indication is the rule out with a very low risk uh, probability of the patient. Why just in uh, rule out patients with a low predisposition probability? Because in those group of patients, the probability that we would like to see even wall motion abnormalities is very low. If the coronaries are normal, then there will be no um, uh, wall motion abnormality. So we don't need any function information. We can go with this uh, single phase uh, prospectively triggered scan at a radiation dose usually below one millisievert. If uh, the, uh, the previous probability is a little bit higher or if the heart rate is a little bit higher and we would like to have even a little bit more wall motion analysis, the prospectively triggered uh, sequence with padding uh, is the po uh, perfect way to go. And if the heart rate is really high, the heart rate is really high and uh, we really would like to get functional information like the wall motion or for for valvular uh, analysis, we should go for the retrospective gating. But again, we are talking about a difference in the radiation dose between one millisievert and eight millisievert. So it becomes challenging. And of course, it's our responsibility to select the uh, appropriate uh, um, triggering technique uh, to the patient depending on the clinical situation. And the old question is, uh, where to start uh, with the protocol optimization, how to put all those different parameters together, and um, uh, how to begin. Well, uh, when we're talking about uh, cardiac uh, CT and geography, the heart rate determines the selection of the trigger mode, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is that the trigger mode and the body mass index uh, will determine the further contrast uh, protocol. 
So again, uh, what we are doing is uh, first to categorize the patient according to the body mass indexes. The body mass index will give you uh, the KV settings, and depending on the KV settings, we are adapting our contrast injection protocol. We are not using an uniphasic, uh, a monophasic injection protocol because there might be the risk that the uh, contrast filling of the right ventricle uh, is not perfect. Sometimes it's uh, really no uh, uh, enhancement, so then it's difficult to assess the, uh, the interventricular septum. But if there is too much contrast within the right ventricle, it could interfere with the assessment of the right coronary artery due to striding artifacts. So what we are doing, um, uh, we don't want this mixing or the streak effects. What we are uh, really would like to have is just a very homogeneous slight filling of the right ventricle with a clear uh, distinction of the intraventricular septum. And the way to go is a biphasic protocol uh, here. So we start with the first phase of pure contrast material, and uh, we continue with the second phase of a uh, uh, one-to-one -one mixture between saline and a contrast. And this gives you a very good and homogeneous enhancement of the right ventricle uh, with, uh, without any streak side effects. So that's a typical uh, protocol if you have a high pitch prospectively triggered scan. 50 ml of contrast with a flow rate of 4. Uh, followed by 20 ml of contrast mixed uh, with uh, saline in a one-to-one -one, uh, mixture, uh, and of course uh, uh, 100 kV if the patient is not obese. So this would be the typical protocol for a prospectively triggered high pitch scan. For a sequence, um, we remain, we go with the same, contra almost same uh, contrast protocol. The only thing that we are changing is the mixture between contrast and saline. So only in the second phase, only 20% of uh, contrast and 80% of saline because the acquisition time is a little bit longer in patients uh, uh, in the sequence protocol. And uh, uh, the usual trigger window that we are using uh, if the heart rate is between 70 and 80 is the trigger window between 30% and 75% uh, of the RR interval. And finally, uh, what we are using in very, very rare cases is the retrospectively triggered scan. We are adding a little bit more uh, contrast to the second phase. Uh, we are reducing a little bit the flow in the second phase because the acquisition time is even longer. And we are going for a one-to-one -one mixture again between the contrast and the saline. And uh, yes, then we have the total uh, trigger window uh, of 0 to 100 percent of the RR interval by using a dose modulation technique to reduce uh, the total uh, radiation exposure to the patient. And of course, we try to apply all the dose-saving strategies that we have learned uh, in the previous uh, webinar, including uh, the dose modulation, the low MIS and online modulation, and of course, the iterative reconstructions later on. And this is just one example of a patient uh, with a heart rate uh, below 75 and a body mass index of 24, 100 uh, kV, 70 ml uh, total amount of uh, contrast, and the dose length product of the anti-examination was uh, just 200 milligray centimeters, uh, and I would say rather very good um, uh, imaging quality in a patient with uh, a coronary artery disease and a lot of calcifications and plaques. Very nice assessment even of all the changes within the uh, wall of uh, the um, LID in this example. So the lower KV protocols uh, are highly recommended, of course, uh, for the coronaries and allow for lowering the total iodine load and reducing, of course, the radiation dose. The reduced iodine flux facilitates the assessment of the vessel wall and the plaque components. And uh, the typical flow rate that we are using is a flow rate uh, around 4 ml uh, per second uh, by using a concentration of uh, 320 uh, milligram uh, iodine per milliliter. Finally, a very uh, upcoming, very important and clinically challenging uh, field of application for CTA is, are the children and even the very, very small children. And really challenging, uh, challenging population because, of course, we have specific risks uh, and challenges to do a CT in neonates and small children. And, uh, of course, I would like to try you to show you some modern ways to face these challenges 
and uh, to give you just an idea about the possible clinical applications in, uh, in CT of the heart in uh, children and even neonates. There are a lot of uh, very good papers um, uh, from the UK about uh, CT application in, um, in children, and this is a very interesting paper. It's about CT of the head, a totally different story. However, I think this summary is a very clear statement, and of course uh, this holds true for all the other applications, that there is in the clinical routine a general re reluctance uh, to send a patient to CT and to sedate the children, and that in fact in the clinical reality uh, CT is less frequently performed in, in neonates and small children as the actual uh, guidelines would recommend. So sometimes there is uh, really a reluctance and sometimes this really leads to a delayed uh, diagnosis uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, of the very small children. And of course, uh, this underuse of CT is uh, from a clinical perspective not perfect. Of course, the specific risks and challenges are uh, manifold, including the radiation exposure, uh, including the preparation of the newborn, placement, fixation, sedation, and of course, the questions about the contraceptive administration, about the venous access, the administration, the dose, and the flow. What about the radiation exposure? Of course, this is the number one uh, uh, challenge and the number one fear in uh, clinical reality. Because the newborns are very sensitive, they're very small, you don't know how old they will be become, so how much dose they will get uh, during lifetime. So the cumulative dose, of course, is a relevant issue. And the practical problem is that the current dose estimations are not really accurate for the, for the newborns. So it's, there is a good reason that there is a radiation fear. And, uh, of course, uh, this is um, the, the topic of many publications and editorials. Uh, these are found in circulation about the friendly fire from the cardiac catheterization. And of course, the radiation uh, from CT is not better as the, uh, the radiation uh, during uh, cardiac catheterization. So of course, the radiation is a big issue. Um, this is a large retrospective cohort study as published in Lancet recently and they really looked for the correlation between uh, CT exposition and the incidence of brain tumors and le leukemia, and they found uh, a relative risk for brain cancer after a cumulative dose of 50 to 74, uh, 74 milligray of uh, being 2.82. But of course, those are those numbers that uh, uh, happily enough we are not uh, providing to the patients anymore. And this is really the very good news, uh, thanks to the new scanners, that those really high uh, radiation, those numbers are not representing the clinical reality anymore. Of course, the radiation exposure is the most relevant uh, challenge, but thanks to the high pitch, low KV, and many other dose reduction strategies, we uh, have been able to dramatically reduce uh, the radiation exposure to the patient during uh, the last couple of years. And just three randomly selected examples of uh, uh, CT scans of neonates uh, with uh, congenital heart disease, you see one with a those length product for the anti-examination, including the topogram um, monitoring and everything of just five milligray. Another example of, um, of a CTA with a uh, dose length product of the total examination of nine. And finally, one example with a DL, DLP of only six. So it becomes really possible to go for very, very, very low dose uh, examination protocols. So just as a summary and as a rule of thumb, the radiation fear should never be a reason anymore not to do an indicated CT even in very small newborns. So if it's needed, you should go for it because the radiation dose has become that low. The second challenge, uh, of course, uh, was always the fixation and the sedation in newborns, and, um, but this is not an uh, issue anymore because thanks to the fast acquisition, you don't need any sedation anymore in uh, most of the cases. So in the small children, you don't need it. And this has been even published that by using the really very, very uh, new scanners with the very short acquisition times, uh, you, can, uh, you can really scan uh, neonates and small children even without sedation. It becomes critical uh, between the age uh, between four and eight years. Uh, then, of course, uh, you need some kind of sedation. But in the very small children and neonates, very 
the sedation is the most critical issue, uh, it's not mandatory anymore because the acquisition is uh, that quick. And there is very good evidence that you can safely do that without a sedation. So this challenge of sedation, the second really huge challenge of uh, examination of uh, small children is solved uh, because we don't need the sedation. So a very, very, uh, very elegant uh, uh, problem solving strategy here. The third challenge is always about the country's administration. Uh, in fact, nowadays, not the volume is the challenge, but the flow and the administration. So when we are talking about the contrast administration to children, we have the usual questions, how much contrast, how and where to apply, who should apply, and how to time the injection. Surprisingly, there is not very good evidence about the uh, dose uh, given to the patients. So there are no clear rules for that. Typically, uh, it's some kind of rule of thumb that we are giving 1.5 to 2 ml uh, of contrast per kilogram body weight. However, there is not clear evidence if this is dangerous or not. So we have small total volumes, but of course, uh, higher doses. Uh, really interesting uh, was this recently be published uh, paper about the effect of the intravenous administration of contrast media on the serum creatinine levels in neonates. And well, a really funny, uh, funny result is sometimes um, uh, in the literature and the publication is that the group of patients undergoing unenhanced CT scans, scans show then higher rates, uh, show then higher rates uh, of uh, the creatinine level as the group of uh, small children receiving uh, contrast material. So. Um, it seems that uh, the contrast material uh, will not have any uh, dismal factor or influence uh, to the very small kids. So again, no fear to give contrast material to the patients. Maybe the dose is sometimes even too high. Uh, when I show you one example of a very small kid, you see that we have a perfect, uh, ex a perfect uh, attenuation of the vascular structures but we have still too much contrast within uh, the brachycephalic uh, and, the, and the right subclavian vein. Uh, the total amount of contrast was just uh, 3 ml. Uh, anyhow, about 50% of the contrast is still stuck in the vein, uh, but we have a very good contrast. So maybe we can even further reduce the total amount of uh, contrast um, because uh, the very small Children with the low dose and low QV protocols really need very small amounts of uh, iodine to end up with uh, almost perfect contrast enhancement. Here, just 3 ml of uh, contrast for this entire examination. So, but not the dose, but the administration is challenging, as I mentioned before. Uh, so, if the patient comes uh, to CT, you have to accept the, the access uh, that is provided, so you will not start to, to place a new cannula if there is all, already a cannula, so you have to know where the ac access is and you have to adapt your protocol according to that to avoid that you end up with just a venous filling and not having an arteriogram. However, the challenge is, of course, the venous access. This is challenging in uh, neonates and very small children. Uh, we have to know uh, the localization, and uh, sometimes there is a mismatch between the size of access and the desired flow, not in the neonates, but in, in, in children. Sometimes they came up with really a very small cannula, but you would aim to give one or two ml uh, per second flow rate, and then maybe it's uh, a little bit a challenge. All questions, should we go for a hand injection or should we use a power injector? Recently published that it doesn't make any difference uh, from the view of the result, uh, if it's done by hand administration or by a power injector. However, in my institution, uh, if you have the manual injection, it's always the question, who should perform the injection? So should the manual injection be done by the radiologist or by the technician? Or should it be done by the nurse coming with the children or even by the mother or the father? Uh, of course, the radiologists and technicians should not be uh, the people uh, to apply uh, the contrast material, to inject the contrast material, because they are professionally exposed, so they should not remain in the examination room. But uh, the nurses, uh, they are not trained, and uh, sometimes the communication can be difficult, and there is some radiation fear even by the nurses or by the pediatricians, so they don't want to stay in the room sometimes. 
one possible solution is to use the power injector and to combine it with a perfect cannula. And I just uh, find out uh, that there are uh, cannulas with uh, side holes and they give the chance for very, very small cannula like the 24 gauge cannula uh, and they are really accepted uh, for uh, contrast agent injection of up to 3 ml per second. So you, you can do everything if you have uh, this cannula and we are uh, currently training our, our pediatricians and anesthesiologists to, to use just those cannulas in the small children. However, they are a little bit, they are more expensive, so they should not be used in routine, but uh, I think for small children, it's well invested money. And if you have an appropriate venous access without any fear of, uh, of uh, venous rupture, you can uh, use the uh, automatic power injector, and this helps to avoid any exposition and this helps uh, to avoid any uh, exposition of the staff or the nurse. I'm sorry, there is a slight technical problem. I hope we can uh, immediately continue. Yes, the pre presentation is already here again. Sorry for that, but um, we are here. It's the old question, especially in small children, about uh, how to time. And uh, for the children, the same is true as for the adults. Uh, we should never use a best guess technique. Um, we should even use a, a bolus a timing technique, even in the children. Uh, the, it's a very, very small amount of uh, additional radiation dose, and it gives you the total safety about uh, uh, a proper timing. In the small children with congenital heart disease, sometimes you don't know on the, based on the monitoring scan, is this the aorta or if this is an abnormal vessel. So we are placing the ROI in the air, and we uh, start and initiate the scan uh, by visual assessment. Uh, and I can just show you two trigger cards or two, two, personal, uh, two patient protocols showing that the radiation exposure due to the monitoring is a very, very uh, small one. And uh, from my point of view, it's really well invested. It's really, really very slightly increasing the total exposure, but it gives you the total safety that you have a perfect timing and you end up with a perfect scan. So the I think the radiation dose increased due to the uh, bolus monitoring is not the relevant issue. CT imaging becomes less challenging with the availability of the third generation dual source scanners. We don't have any need for anesthesia. Uh, the radiation dose can be dramatically reduced and uh, even the contrast uh, dose can be further uh, reduced in the small children as well. Of course, uh, the indication uh, should be critically reviewed still, uh, so especially CT of the brain is an issue in the children, but radiation fear should never be the basis for decision making. Those optimization is the way, if there is a clear indication, optimize your scan and of course do the scan and no, uh, no hesitation and no fear. Again, not the contrast volume in children is the challenge, but sometimes the administration. Um, this uh, new uh, venous cannula can be really helpful uh, because they allows for the application of the automatic injection in all circumstances. And never forget, never do a best guess technique. Please always go for the bolus triggering. It's a small amount of additional radiation dose, but it's really, really well invested. And by this, uh, the uh, risks and challenges uh, in children could be really dramatically reduced. And of course, these allow for new applications and the wider use. And uh, I will just show you in um, just a few examples that even congenital heart disease in non, uh, not yet operated children becomes an, a field for CT and the cardiac surgeons really start to love CT because CT is very easy to read and uh, it provides the total overview about the even complex anatomical situation uh, and they don't get this anatomical information neither from MR nor from, uh, from ANGEL, and CT is really able to provide the situa anatomical situation visualization at a glance. However, keep in mind, we don't have any functional information yet, so uh, it cannot replace everything, but it can really provide a very 
good anatomical overview. Like in this patient, a very young patient uh, at day three, uh, around three kilogram pulmonary atresia, uh, uh, ventricular septal defect and overriding aorta. And the question was, is there any surgical replacement of the aorta pulmonary collateral arteries possible, yes or no? And uh, I'm really happy to show you those images. Five ml of contrast were given with manual injection. No sedation, heart rate 140, and the image quality is like that. So we see perfectly this ventricular septal defect, the overriding aorta here, and of course these MAPCAS, these uh, pulmonary aorta pulmonary uh, collateral arteries. So those are not those are these uh, these collateral arteries. Uh, there is no normal pulmonary artery, and this was perfect for further planning of the surgery. Of course, we can also look for the perfusion of the lung parenchyma, and the very nice story always is to look afterwards at the, uh, at the patient protocol because the uh, total dose is very, very low. And uh, it's always and still fun to look at these cards because it's uh, really a very uh, breakthrough in, uh, in clinical managing of those patients. Another very small patient uh, with aortic interruption, a little bit more than three kilogram. And the question was about the distance between the uh, different parts, the separated part of the uh, aorta uh, to plan uh, the surgery. And again, of course, the heart rate was rather high, around 140, just 3 ml of contrast, and maybe not the most, uh, most beautiful images, but highly diagnostic. So we see here the continuation of the pulmonary artery to the descending aorta. So the descending aorta is perfused via the patent ductus arteriosus, and uh, there is a total interruption between the ascending and the descending aorta. And again, the nice, uh, the nice thing, a DLP of just four milligray centimeters, very, very uh, low dose. It's really, really fun uh, to look at that. Third example, an, a little bit older, nine months old uh, patient with uh, congenitally uh, corrected transposition of the great arteries, but now suffering from, uh, from um, uh, some rhythmological problems. And again, the question was to plan for surgery. Heart rate 110, uh, since uh, the kid was a little bit uh, older, um, we have uh, a, uh, 9 ml of contrast. And you see here, the, the images look a little bit different, so the dose was a little bit higher here. And uh, this gives you a very, very nice and great overview as well. And here, the radiation dose was, uh, was quite higher in this patient. So let me come to my conclusion. CT can provide the uh, uh, three-dimensional di view from outside, and that's a totally new thing. And uh, it's highly requested by the, um, uh, by the cardiac surgeons. It provides a fantastic overview about the uh, anatomical situation. Uh, real low-dose scanning becomes possible. However, we cannot provide hemodynamically information like uh, measurements of the, of the oxy, uh, oxygenations. So CT cannot uh, uh, not, uh, replace uh, the angel in the congenital heart disease, but can be a really important add-on and provide the surgeons with the perfect overview about the uh, anatomical situations. And now I'm finished not only with uh, the webinar of today, but even with uh, the entire story about how to improve my daily CT and geography. Uh, I hope you enjoyed a little bit. I hope it was fun. Uh, yeah, and I'm more than happy to, to try my best to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Leva, for this fantastic, uh, really very interesting presentation with a lot of practical advice how to do a CT angiography in a better way. Uh, we have a few questions came in, and uh, let me just very quickly uh, tell you the first one. How you, uh, what kind of, and what volume of contrast you are using for acute aortic imaging? It's uh, mostly about the volume for the contrast. 
Well, again, uh, it depends on the uh, on the body weight of the patient uh, and on the on the KV settings. So, what we are using for an uh, CT angiography of the entire artery is uh, something between 80 and 100 ml uh, of contrast at an uh, iodine concentration of 320. Thank you. And uh, uh, another question about the aortic uh, imaging. During the CT angiography of the aorta, do you suggest ECG gating for the whole aorta or just for the thoracic part? If it's just the thoracic part, uh, what contrast injection protocol would you recommend? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. It's it's depending uh, it's depending on the on the scanner that you're using. Um, if you have really a third generation scanner. I would uh, go for the for the ECG triggering for the entire author. Um, uh, if uh, the acquisition time would be a little bit longer, then then of course it's more efficient to trigger just the uh, the aortic part of the author and then to to start and, and second scan. And usually the the time gap is just three to four seconds, so nothing serious. So you will still be able to have an arterial phase scan of the abdominal author. But in that case, uh, when we have a, a flow rate of 4 ml per second, and if we are increasing the acquisition time by 3 to 4 seconds because we have this time gap, I would add another 15 to 20 ml of contrast just to be on the safe side that you have uh, a good arterial contrast enhancement till the final end of your acquisition. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, how do you remove the bone attached with a nearby artery with calcification? I think it's quite a technical question related to the image. Well, the, the calcifications, well, when, when, when you have very, very small diameter arteries, uh, heavily calcified, then there is no way to, to, reduce, to, to remove the calcification so far. You can just play around by using a dense kernel and, and to play around with the window settings, but there is no automatic tool, um, to my knowledge, available. Uh, it has been uh, proposed by some manufacturers and, of course, by some, some publications and papers that the dual energy might help to do some kind of subtraction. But, uh, in fact, uh, it's still not in the, in the clinical routine. Uh, there are a lot of artifacts. Sometimes too much out of the vessel is cut it off. Uh, since the calcifications you usually show an intensive blurring. So, in fact, uh, the only way to go is to try to reconstruct your curved planar reformat to have a centralized path. But in the very small arteries of the, of the calf with a diameter of uh, 2 millimeters or even less, sometimes it's not possible to safely differentiate between calcifications within the wall and uh, persisting open luminal channel. So sometimes it's uh, it's mandatory, if you would like to have a non-invasive diagnosis, to add an MR angiography uh, because you don't see the calcifications at the MR. Um, I would not recommend just to go for the MR because then you don't see the calcifications. And the information about the calcification is an important one when it comes to treatment. It's important for the surgeon. They have to know if there is calcification to place the bypass graft. Uh, but even for endovascular treatments, it's important to know if it's heavily calcified, yes or no. So I would still go for CT first. And um, uh, if you still are not able to safely assess the pathology uh, due to calcifications at the lower leg arteries, I would try to add an additional uh, MR angiography, or I say, while well, the patient is suffering from severe symptoms, I go directly to the angel, and um, I do a diagnostic angel um, ready to do a PDA in the same setting. Uh, thank you very much for this very clear answer. Uh, the next question is about a pediatric uh, application. What is the rate of injection yep. you recommend for children and infants? Pardon me? The, what is the rate of injection, injection speed, I assume? The injection speed, well, what we are doing is first we, we are calculating the, the uh, out and volume or the, the contrast volume, and uh, we, are, we are working with uh, a, a rule of thumb of 1.5 ml per kilogram body weight. 
in the very small children, if the, if the children are a little bit bigger, then we are going down uh, to 1 ml um, per kilogram body weight. Then uh, we are planning our, um, our uh, acquisition and uh, we adapt the acquisition speed to the, uh, to the, um, well, we adapt, sorry, we adapt the injection speed to the length of the acquisition. So when we have a given time of uh, post-threshold delay plus acquisition, we should try to inject as long uh, as we are scanning. So that means when we have a delay time maybe of 10 seconds and then we have an acquisition time of one second, we are talking about 11 seconds. When we uh, have calculated a total volume of uh, 4 ml of uh, contrast to be given uh, uh, to the child, then we would end up with an injection speed of 0 0.3 ml per second, just to cover the entire period uh, where the scanner is working. And usually an acquisition uh, speed or injection speed of 0 0.3 is, is not an issue. And there are even some power injectors uh, being able to, to inject even this very slow injection speed. So you can do it even by using a power injector. Thanks for that. Uh, I read the question. I'm not sure I understand what it means. What is your experience uh, of VNC? It may be an abbreviation which is clear for you. Of VNC? Yes, that's the question. Probably it's an abbreviation. I don't know what it means. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, <laughs> disregard this question because uh, we don't have too much time. So let's jump to the next one. What is the value of high pitch for you? Of the high pitch acquisition? Yeah, I assume. Well, yes. Yeah, uh, in children, it's uh, it's the big deal when you're talking about when we're talking about um, um, congenital heart disease. Uh, the very small children they always come in with a heart rate of 140, 150. So uh, there is no chance to reduce the heart rate down to 70, what we would like to aim for. So uh, there there is very difficult to do some kind of ECG triggering because usually ECG triggering is not working at a hardware of 150. So the alternative in children is really to try your best to, to scan as quick as even possible. And uh, high pitch scanning is providing a very, very fast acquisition and uh, helps you to, to receive a sharp image of the, of the heart even without having an uh, ECG triggering mode. Usually, or sometimes you cannot perfectly assess the coronary arteries, but usually in the children, the coronaries are not, uh, not the most important structures. Usually the, the very small kids are not suffering from coronary artery disease. Uh, it's more about the, the, the chambers uh, and, the, and, the, and the great vessels, and they can perfectly be seen without ECG irrigating. And anatomical uh, uh, anomalies of the coronary arteries can also be seen on this uh, high pitch scan. The second uh, very important thing is that the acquisition of the entire examination is that, that short that you don't need any sedation in the small children. So if the acquisition is less than one second, there is even no time for the children to move and you can, you can have a really very motion artifact free acquisition without having any sedation. And the same is true for imaging in adults. If there is anything that you keeps you away from, from uh, using ECG triggering, so th this might be total arrhythmia or it's really an, an high emergency and you don't have um, any chance to place your electrodes, then a very good alternative is the high pitch scanning because it allows you for very, very quick acquisition, very fast diagnosis, and a really um, uh, significant dose reduction. Thank you. Uh, in the meantime, the previous maybe I can maybe maybe I can just come back to the to the VNC question. So that, that yeah. uh, I think uh, the question was about virtual non-contrast. Correct. And uh, and the the well the only application that we are using the virtual uh, non-contrast in vascular imaging 
is uh, what I've shown you is this, this, this three-in-one protocol uh, after endovascular aortic repair. Uh, because the patient really comes in frequently. They might have some calcifications within the aneurysm sac, and sometimes it's difficult to differentiate between an endoleak and the calcifications. So the native scan is of some value. And just to, to save those, uh, since the patient have to come on a yearly basis, we are using this virtual non-contrast uh, uh, in this uh, situation. So we have one uh, contrast enhanced scan. We are calculating the virtual non contrast for safely uh, differentiating between the endoleak and uh, calcifications within the uh, aneurysm sac. Thank you. This is very clear. Uh, there are a couple of questions about the image you managed to do with 500 ml or 500 uh, ml concentration, 500 ml contrast media how you could really achieve the image you have shown using that 500 ml on a 128 slice CT machine. Is it possible? I not perfectly understand the question because what do what you mean with 500 ml? 500 uh, CT is I think Five. this is the exact wording. 50, 50, 50 ml. Uh, if I say 50 ml. I, yeah, 500 okay, so. cc. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 50 ml. I, I, I'm sorry. Um, well, of course, it's it's only possible in combination with uh, with the uh, with low kV setting. Uh, so if you have a 70 or 80 kV protocol, uh, then you can uh, you can also reduce the iodine uh, the iodine uh, concentration. And then okay. you you don't need uh, so much, and then you can reduce even the, the flow rate down to 3 ml per second uh, with uh, 50 ml of contrast, but just in combination with low KV. So again, the step is first of all uh, categorize your patient according to the body mass, then uh, decide the KV protocol, and then adapt the total amount of contrast uh, you you need uh, according uh, to these KV settings. Thanks a lot. And uh, let me have the last question before we wrap up. Uh, we are quite out of time. Uh, there is a question about your recommendation of the contrast concentration for obese patients and coronary angiography. What concentration would you would be your choice? Well, uh, the, the impact of the concentrate. Uh, I'm not changing the the. the concentration of the contrast according to the body mass or to the situation. So uh, even to make your life easier, I think, uh, is to make the decision to go for one one concentration and then you to adapt all your protocols according to this concentration. So what we never do is to change the contrast material depending on the on this clinical situation or depending on the on the uh, on the constitution of the patient. What we are changing and what we are playing around is about the flow rate because if the patient is more obese and you have to increase your KV settings, you need more iodine uh, molecules per time in, in, uh, at, uh, uh, in your area of interest. So you have to increase the iodine delivery rate. We are not doing that by increasing the iodine concentration of the agent. We are doing that by increasing the flow, uh, the flow rate of the contrast injection. And of course, uh, by increasing the total volume, because if we inject a, a higher, with a higher speed, uh, we have to, um, increase the volume to end up with the similar um, injection time. But we are not adapting the uh, iodine concentration. We are adapting the, uh, the iodine delivery rate by increasing the, uh, the flow rate. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to thank you for the whole presentation again and answering uh, so many questions we had and uh, taking the extra time. Thanks a lot for the audience, and I uh, hope everybody found this session very useful. I think the content was really very informative and a lot of practical uh, advices which we can apply in the clinical practice. Uh, we will send out a survey after this uh, uh, webinar to understand what you found useful and uh, how we can improve our, our content and, and also our performance next time. Again, thanks a lot, and wish you a very nice day. Thank you.